Hello friends, welcome to Be Based Wise. I am Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Based Wise. And today we are here to, uh, to discuss with Kat and Francesca about upcycling food waste. Before I introduce Kat and Francesca to you, a little bit about Be Waste Wise. We are a nonprofit organization. We try to address the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. Currently, we've been organizing two webinars every month on different facets of waste, sustainability, sanitation, and climate change by and large. Today, we have Kat Heinrich, who's a food waste specialist in Australia. She works with RawTech. She's moderated other panels on food waste for us. If you have not seen them, please head to the video panel section of our website and you will find them there. And Kat is going to talk to Francesca Goodman-Smith. She's a waste minimization manager at Foodstuffs New Zealand. And uh, today's topic is, uh, we were just talking before the broadcast began about how interesting this is for a wide range of people. Personally, I'm very interested to listen to what the discussion is, uh, what are the new things that I'm going to be learning in today's conversation. So over to you, Kat. Just a reminder to the audience members, please use the Q&A section, put in your questions. Kat will be taking the questions as and when they are relevant to the point of the discussion. So yes, over to you, Kat. Thank you very much, Sweetha. Um, so just wanted to touch on um, before we start about food waste, just taking a step back, why we're investing so much time talking about it. Um, as many of you know, as around the world, we waste about a third of all food that's produced. And when you think about it, when you're wasting food, you're wasting all the embedded water, energy, fertilizer, and all the time that's spent to grow that food that ultimately goes in the bin. And when it comes to tackling food waste, perhaps the most important player is supermarkets. Supermarkets influence food waste generation up the supply chain through their contractual arrangements but they also help shape attitudes and the behaviours of consumers. So I'm excited today to be here with Francesca Goodman-Smith to be talking about how New Zealand's largest grocery retailer is taking positive steps to reduce waste. So shortly I'll be having a chat with Francesca and talking about upcycling food. And I just wanted to share a bit of a fun fact with you um, today, which um, we were talking about before the webinar started, which is that Australia's most famous food, Vegemite, um, that maybe a few of you have heard about far and wide, um, is actually an upcycled food product. It's made from leftover brewer's extract. So um, I've actually been eating upcycled food since I was a little girl. So there you go. There's plenty more examples I'm sure Francesca will share with you today. So <laughs> Francesca will share um, some of the interesting findings from some recent um, consumer uh, behaviour research about the attitudes towards upcycled products. We'll also be discussing some of the barriers and opportunities for this particular product area, as well as talking about international developments in food standards. So a warm welcome to you, Francesca. Thanks, Kat. It's great to be here. So just to kick off for the audience, um, Francesca, can you share a little bit about yourself and your work in this space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I started my food waste journey a wee while ago when I was at university. Um, I started off studying nutrition and then step by step sort of picked up some papers in environmental management and one particularly interesting paper about uh, food and consumers. And a part of that was uh, about food waste and that really sparked my interest in the area. So I went on to do a master's um, quantifying food waste in supermarkets. It was a pretty messy job, um, diving in landfill skips and um, weighing all of the waste and separating it into different waste streams. But it was an amazing uh, insight into the opportunity that food waste really presents um, when it comes to usable resource streams and um, you know all of the beautiful, um, beautiful food that could go somewhere else. So I met some great people through doing my masters and um, one of the organizations I worked with was Foodstuffs New Zealand, which is our biggest grocery retail chain. We have a, a, lots of different supermarket brands and convenience stores uh, and wholesale brands as well. And I was lucky enough to um, get a job there as the waste minimization manager. Uh, so now I'm working with the stores and our supply chain to try and minimize waste across all waste streams. I've been um, developing a waste strategy, setting some targets and trying to get 100% of our business units on board 
um, so that we can measure and track progress towards waste minimization. Excellent. And just for the audience, can you define what is meant by upcycled food? I gave the example with Vegemite before, but is there a, a particular definition? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a organization based in the US called the Upcycled Food Association, and they, um, they formed about a year ago. And they put together a task force to try and define upcycled food because, you know, there were there were these all of these concepts kind of like the Vegemite and things coming around that were um, new products that were utilizing byproducts or surplus products and they wanted to really define it and and get a group of people together to kind of accelerate the sector so they got um, experts from Harvard University, Drexel University, the World Resources Institute, lots of other actors along the food supply chain and they kind of they defined upcycled food with three key areas so it was um, food that would otherwise not have gone to human consumption um, that came from a verifiable supply chain and also had a positive environmental benefit. So in essence, what it really means is that um, food waste, food surplus byproducts are used as an ingredient or an input into new food products. Excellent. And so in terms of the food waste hierarchy, which some of you on the call might be familiar with, it's best to avoid uh, food in the first place rather than it being downgraded or turned into another product. So it's about keeping food in the human consumption supply chain as long as possible. So obviously upcycling food waste is doing that. So it's really important. Um, so can you give some other examples apart from Vegemite, um, Francesca, uh, on what upcycled food products exist already? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I kind of first came across the whole concept of upcycled Food through a really innovative new startup who approached us wanting to turn our deli meat waste in the supermarkets into pet food. Um, and so that's sort of, that's one example. I think uh, pet food is a really big category for upcycled foods. One, because there's lots of really high quality surplus meat from trimming and butchering processes, um, also from abattoirs as well, that can, you know, be given a new lease of life. Um, and also it's usually a food category that is separate from other things. So nice and easy to kind of keep that in a distinct supply chain and move it on to better and higher uses. Uh, another company that we've been working with is making craft beer out of stale bread. So that's a really innovative, um, a really innovative idea. And they then turn the spent grain from that beer making process back into a flour to make artisan bread again. So it's a really nice closed loop cycle. I think the beer making process is one of the most circular out there. We're talking about Vegemite from beer, uh, music bars from beer, and and beer from from other products from bread. So that's that's an excellent example. Um, so yeah. how much uh, potentially how much food could we potentially be upcycling? What's the limits to this? opportunity. Yeah, so I think it's, it's really hard to quantify, um, one, because global data on food waste are really just ballpark estimates. Um, food waste is a really hard thing to measure, especially because when it goes to landfill, it's mixed with all these other things. So very hard to get a segregated kind of solid waste stream. But there's a few kind of descriptive statistics around the food waste topic that we can kind of use to to point us in the right direction. So um, the, the, the price um, kind of put on, on what, what food waste um, amounts to globally, worldwide every year is a trillion dollars. Um, so that's a large amount of money. 28% um, of agricultural land um, used to grow food. Um, actually, that food never gets to a human mouth. Um, and in New Zealand, 500,000 tonnes of food goes to landfill every year. So we kind of, you know, those are some sort of big lofty numbers. Um, in the US, uh, the, there, was, there was a study done in 2019 that found that the kind of market size for upcycled food is about $46 billion um, worth. And they indicate that that probably will grow 5% year on year. So um, it's pretty big in terms of the sort of financial opportunity there. 
Yeah, okay. So given it's such a big opportunity, it's no surprise then that Free Stuff New Zealand is, is looking at this opportunity. And I understand that you did some consumer research um, to find out more about consumer attitudes toward upcycled food. And what was the purpose of that research? What were you aiming to find? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we we started kind of hearing more, more and more from companies approaching us, um, not only to try and um, see if we had surplus waste generated from our own operations, but also to see with whether they could stock their products on the shelf. And because it's such a new concept and new category, um, there was a little bit of hesitancy. You know, people had heard about the global trend around upcycling, but they weren't necessarily sure that it would work in New Zealand or that consumers had heard about it. So um, I worked with some amazing researchers at Drexel University in the US and also Otago University here in New Zealand to design a survey to try and really unpick some of those um, motivators and barriers that people might have towards um, upcycled foods, also just find out general awareness and most importantly, whether people would be willing to try it or buy it as well. And what, what did you find in that research? What were the main Yeah, ideas? so we, we surveyed a thousand um, New Zealand uh, customers, I guess, or participants, um, just New Zealanders from all walks of life um, and asked them lots of different questions about upcycled food. The very first question was, had they heard of it before? Um, and only 10% of those surveyed had actually heard of upcycled foods before. Um, which is not surprising considering we don't have many on the market here in New Zealand. We also don't have a sector around it. Um, there's no kind of seal or um, like accreditation process um, yet that you can go through to actually put something on the front of pack to identify um, your, your product as an upcycled food. So there's lots of reasons why we kind of um, weren't surprised by that result. But the next result we were really surprised by, so um, we, we gave a quite a vanilla definition of what upcycled foods was. We didn't want to kind of lead anybody down any thought track, um, but just really basically explained that it was um, food products made from food surplus and byproducts that was safe. Uh, and after consumers heard that, 81% were willing to try or buy upcycled foods. Um, which was a really great result. Oh, wow. um, yeah, and so there were kind of there was a group of, of about six percent who said um, they wouldn't be willing to try or buy it. And some of the concerns, the main concerns around that was around food quality um, and 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 food safety. Okay, so did you say eighty one percent was it were willing to give it a go? So that's a yeah. huge percentage. So. How do you then market to those people? How do you make people, how do you best sell upcycled food to get that uptake? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's because it's so new, um, it's very hard to figure out, you know, what's going to work and what isn't. And I think it's it's important that we get these products in front of customers and really socialise them um, and match it with really good education as well. Um, I think having claims and labels is very important. Uh, recently, Colmar Brunton uh, did a survey in New Zealand, which was also a, a thousand participant side survey, asking about a whole suite of um, questions. And it's, it's the Better Futures survey that they do year on year. Um, and 70% of their participants recognised that uh, claims and labels were really important to them in terms of um, trying to make sustainable decisions purchasing decisions and also 60% of participants were willing to um, make eco-conscious decisions even if it costs more. So we recognise that kind of labelling, education, that, that sort of visibility of what upcycled foods are is quite important and we actually asked a question in the survey around what kind of information people would like. I've got a slide here that I might share because there's quite a bit of information um, on it. So I will have a go at sharing my screen. Just let me know if you can see that one there. Can do, yep, excellent. Cool, All right, so um, we asked the customers what they would want. Um, so out of, out of these listed 
uh, claims or pieces of information, how important they would find them. So for every piece of information, at least 80% of those surveyed thought it was important to know that information. So the, the list of things we asked was, um, they'd like to see the list of, uh, of the countries that the upcycled food was from, um, the list of ingredients and the industry that the upcycled um, ingredients were from, the, um, the product actually had a third party verification from an independent authority um, that it was clearly labeled, that it contained upcycled foods um, and what industry they came from. And also they want to be able to see um, the price comparative to conventional products. So one of the things that um, we, these were all prompted questions. So it's hard to know whether it was this exact information that people wanted or whether it was um, it was more that they just wanted as much information as they could have about these products because they are so new. Um, but I think it's it's going to be crucial that organisations like the Upcycled Food Association um, really get out there and share that message about upcycled foods, where they come from, that they're safe, um, allay some of those fears that consumers might have around safety and quality. Um, I think also giving consumers opportunities to actually try the products is really important. So um, we're going to be working really closely with some of the up and coming businesses to actually do taste testers in the stores uh, so that consumers can actually get a sense for the quality that these products can be. Oh, absolutely. And so there's a lot of information, Francesca, that you shared on, as you said, you're not sure if it's because you prompted them or whether they would have independently come up with um, wanting that information. But there's already so much labelling at the moment on products with health and where it's made and nutritional value, etc. So are there other opportunities that supermarkets are exploring to promote? Like, could you, for example, have an aisle that's dedicated to upcycling food? Are there any other ideas on how to best promote these products? Yeah, so one of the other questions we actually asked the consumers was, would you like to see this in a specific section of the supermarket? Would you like to see it as, you know, where gluten-free foods are or where health foods are? Um, or would you like to see it blended in the supermarket? And um, over 50% of participants actually wanted to see it right there next to the conventional product. And that theme kind of came through quite a lot in the survey questions that they they really wanted to um, be able to draw those comparisons. They looked at this um, at upcycled foods as a direct substitute for other things that they were purchasing. Um, so they wanted to make price comparisons, quality comparisons, um, and it's much easier to do that if they can see it right next to um, the product that they're substituting it for. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so like in Australia, for example, we have um, when you're buying a product, the dollar per 100 grams, so you can compare things or dollar per piece, so you can compare the price directly when you're comparing products. So your, your point there about it being in that same section so you can make those other comparisons is, is a good one. So when it comes yeah. to, uh, uh, sorry, go on. Oh, I was just going to say the price element is, is quite an interesting one. And a group of researchers from Drexel University in the US, they did a really big piece of research around price and consumers' willingness to pay for upcycled foods. Um, and that those themes did kind of come through um, in, in this research as well. The results that they found was that off the bat, without any other context, consumers weren't willing to pay more for upcycled foods. But if they received rational messaging around those foods, like, uh, for example, facts about how, about what was being diverted, facts about the environmental outcomes that this food was contributing towards that increased their willingness to pay. So I think it will be quite interesting to sort of see where it, where it fits. We asked a question about, you know, all things considered equal price, quality, um, would you be, how willing would you be to try or buy these products? And about 70% said they would be willing to try or buy them um, with all things considered equal. Interesting. And what other steps can supermarkets take to help with the growth of upcycled foods? You talked about some of the labelling aspects, but what other things can supermarkets do? 
I think it's um for for us anyway, involving everybody in the journey is really important and empowering different uh different staff members um to to sort of see how they can be part of solving this environmental problem but also offering customers really great um options in terms of interesting foods to try so one of the reasons why we had such a high level of buy-in was actually working with upcycled food manufacturers to pr provide our own food surplus to them. So it, it really got buy-in from staff who were there on the front line, collecting the product, putting it aside, storing it, giving it to the driver who came and picked it up. Um, it also gave the, the store owners and the store managers were really behind it because they could see the opportunity to then sell it back in their stores. Um, and people were really interested that it was that we could be part of the journey as well. So I think um, in terms of in terms of upcycled food companies who are up and coming, if they can involve the retailer in some way, even if it's not directly, it might be through connections um, to you know to where they where they source their food products from um, or other areas along the food supply chain. I think it's that um, that real um experience of being part of that journey that really builds the trust and um when people were putting food aside you know they knew that it was safe and they it gave them confidence so yeah that that's definitely a key part that i think has contributed to us here in new zealand really responding well to upcycled foods and i have a couple of questions coming in here on the, the chat box so i don't know if um if it's possible, but in the question is, is it allowed in New Zealand or Australia to upcycle food that consumers waste? So we're talking about post-consumer waste, if collected safely. So are you aware, Francesca, of any upcycling of, of consumer food? I'm not aware of any upcycling of, of um, yeah, post-consumer food waste. Um, I think the... So so when you're, when you're producing a food product, you have to have a very um, a, a verified supply chain and monitoring processes at every single part of that supply chain, including the collection, the transport, the storage, all of that. Um, and that's part of what gives consumers in New Zealand confidence that all the products on their supermarket shelves are safe to, to eat. And I think that um, if you started going down that track when you were collecting consumer food waste, you um, you might not be able to put all of those proactive measures in place in order to um, to ensure that safety and to meet those um, guidelines that, for example, in New Zealand, it's our Ministry for Primary Industries. They regulate that that market, and it's set out in our Food Act exactly what the requirements are. Um, Kat, I don't know if you've got anything to add from an Australian perspective. I agree with you. I'm not aware of in Australia being able to up cycle food that has been um, surplus food from a household for example but what I am aware of is in places like South Korea um, they they heat treat the food waste and turn it into animal feed so that's taking a step down in the food hierarchy that we we're talking about before it's not it's not keeping food um, directly eaten by humans but it's then feeding it to animals which then we consume so it's that next step down but I agree with those potential safety concerns and being able to track um, where the food comes from to, to, to be careful about that. I have another couple of questions coming in. Um, interested in uh, the application of upcycling food in lower income countries. Um, there's some questions about you know countries in Africa and India what promise does it hold for developing countries to tap into the industry is the question that we have. Yeah, I think there is an absolutely massive opportunity, um, especially in, in countries like Africa. So when you look at the data across the food supply chain for developing countries, most of the food waste is created at that production end rather than the consumption end. Whereas if you look at countries, um, more de more developed countries or higher income countries, the um, most of the food waste is concentrated down that consumption end of the spectrum. So kind of in, in relation to what we were talking about in the question before, um, you know, 
the production the production level food surplus is a massive resource that can be used um, very safely and it comes from um, verified supply chains. So there's a massive opportunity there. And I think, you know, the closer that food gets to to the um, to its raw product, the more you can do with it and the more, um, yeah, the more opportunities you have. So I think this is an incredible opportunity for, um, for lower income countries to look into. Um, it's also um, a lot of the foods that are surplus are very highly um, nutritional. You know, they, they're, they're raw, unprocessed foods. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a big um, nutrient pool that, um, that's available there too. Yeah, I was just thinking about your comment there, um, Francesca, about up the supply chain before the food is wasted. Another example from Australia is um, we have a lot of apples that have been rejected because they weren't cosmetically perfect, so they weren't the right shape or they were bruised or something like that. This was occurring across the Adelaide Hills, and I'm aware of a cider company that actually started up and they made um, apple cider out of these apples. So, it's, of course, it's common sense, but... That's another example of where before it even reaches the supermarket, um, these products can be uh, sent for upcycling rather than um, going to landfill or being composted and biogas um, options. So yeah, another person just asked, what is the best method for treating food composting or biogas? So yeah, just on that, we're touching on the food waste hierarchy. So the best thing is to avoid the waste generation in the first place, keeping it in the human consumption um, chain as long as possible. So reducing waste, upcycling food, um, then feeding it to animals, then I would say anaerobic digestion and, and composting before landfill is the last option there. So I don't know if you have anything else to add there, Francesca, on, on that <laughs> question there. Um, I was just sort of, I was still pondering over the, the, the opportunities for developing countries and I was thinking, you know, it's a, it's a really big opportunity for job creation as well and employment because it's instead of just having this linear cycle of food moving along this linear supply chain, you then end up with, you know, one, um, you, the growing process, then being able to go in lots of different directions and creating lots of different products and employment and, and moving that food through, through more supply chains. So um, that's just another thing that popped into my head as well. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, absolutely resonate with you on um, you know keeping it up high up the um, high up the food supply chain. Our 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 waste minimization program at Foodstuffs is really focused on reduction being the primary objective. Um, so we are, we're looking into software solutions that can really help us optimize our processes in store so that our ordering is really efficient, so that we are um, only making what customers need in terms of the fresh food departments um, but inevitably there is some food waste that occurs and it's making sure that you're segregating that so that you can make sure it goes to the highest value use and and, and upcycling it is, is one of those um, answers as well as um, food redistribution to food rescue organizations. Mm, absolutely and just looking at it from the perspective of organizations that are making upcycle food so businesses what are some of the barriers that they're currently facing when it comes to getting these products out on the market um biggest barriers i think it's it's probably a, a lot of it comes down to um category managers so um when you're at a, in a supermarket uh, each different food kind of group has a category manager who decides what products they want to buy, where they're positioned on the shelf, how much of each product, um, and what ones to substitute for when new products come onto the market. So I think there's there's not a lot of awareness um, amongst category managers for upcycled food and the substitutions that can be made between upcycled food and conventional products. So um, one of the main reasons that we did this research was to pr provide really good solid evidence in a local context so that we could talk to our category managers about the value and the potential of upcycled foods. So as soon as I got the results back, I compiled them and I sent them out to our category managers, particularly the ones who um, were dealing with 
um, meat or pet food or um, bread because those were kind of the big categories we were working on um, and that gave them confidence and since then we've seen a few more coming onto the shelf but I think education internally is really important and good leadership from um, from the supermarket businesses to say look this is a really big opportunity it's a global food trend um, and the Upcycled Food Association in the US are doing a really great job of kind of bringing different players, bringing food manufacturers and retailers together to, to collaborate and to, um, to raise awareness for the sector as well. Yeah, it's really important the role that, as you mentioned, that organisations um, can play in bringing the industry together and helping making the case for these products to be put on the shelves. Can you touch a little bit more about um, your involvement? I understand you're in, you've been doing some work in the Upcycled Food Standards um, Committee. So can you touch on what work you've been doing there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, after the um, Upcycled Food Association brought together their task force to come up with a definition, one of the next projects that fell out of that was actually designing a standard and a certification process for upcycled foods because it was widely recognised that um, that there aren't you know, ways for consumers to identify these products on the shelf. So I've been working with a group of really experienced um, people from all across the food supply chain to help design um, a standard. So we've been we've, we started on that in June and it's just gone out for consultation. So um, it's actually open to public consultation at the moment. It closes on the 4th of, of uh, December. So if anybody is interested in providing feedback or having a read of that first draft of the certification, um, let us know and we can send out a link to that. Uh, the standard kind of steps through what different um, food manufacturers or ingredient producers would be eligible to apply for such a standard and then what the core requirements are for them and also some broader educational requirements. Um, we really spent quite a bit of time weighing up where the sector's at, um, what resources they have available, and then what information we want to go, uh, we want to obtain along with aspirational goals. So um, it's quite clearly laid out there what the vision is for the future, but also what's realistic for now. No, that's, that's great. And so that report that you talked about, that, that consultation, um, maybe at the end we'll check with Sweeper, but perhaps um, the link can be, be sent around with a follow-up email or something like that for those who want to comment. So when it comes to upcycled food, um, are there any additional standards in terms of quality or, or environmental standards that they, people need to comply with compared to a, a, a standard food item? Um, no, so not that I'm aware of. Uh, for example, with pet food. Um, so if you're producing pet food out of ingredients that have been through a supply chain already, you go down a slightly different regulatory process. You're called a further pet food manufacturer. So you're, um, it it's kind of sets out who, uh, who that applies to. So um, that's one example that I'm aware of that you kind of, you have those sort of additional requirements. There aren't any um, specific certification requirements or other expectations um, that organisations are to have when they are producing an upcycled food compared to a regular conventional food product. Uh, but I guess it's, it's, um, it's always assumed that they apply with all of the um, regulation of the governing law in the country that they're producing out of. Um, yeah. I think we, you know, we we did actually talk about, you know, do you do you expect should we be expecting through a certification process um, organisations to have other accreditations because they are all indicating, you know, positive environmental benefit and X Y Z, uh, but then you become you sort of get in this tricky position where you're being held accountable for other certification processes, so it does get a little bit messy. Um, and kind of like you said before, Kat, you know, real estate on the front of a package is really, um, it, you know, it's, it's prime real estate there and um, people have to be picky and choosy about what they actually want to put there on the front of their packaging. So, if, you know, if it's one certification that's then requiring you to have all these other ones, 
um, it might become less appealing. Yeah, I wonder more broadly whether we can have a certification for the sustainability of products. So not just upcycling, mm. but considering all aspects of sustainability, having one global um, standard, if you like, around the world. So because you could you could consider the circularity of, of products altogether, like how, how sustainable was its production in terms of water and energy consumption? Is it using recycled content packaging? Is it, you know, using upcycled um, products so there's a whole bunch of elements that could work together and I think the last thing we want is a hundred different standards for these different aspects it would be nice just to have one standard for sustainability of, of food. Um, yeah absolutely I think the the GRI um, framework that's used for for measuring environmental social impact of an organization or of a product is a really good foundation it, it's very holistic and I think as companies sort of are starting to to measure more of their environmental and social outcomes something like that would become much easier um, so it's laying the laying those foundations to be able to come up with a more comprehensive framework and you mentioned before that some of the solutions um, for supermarkets was well, of upcycling the food but also food donations to I assume charities that are redistributing that food to, to people facing um, that have a need. How does the supermarket balance those two? So on the one hand, they want to donate the food to charities, and the other hand, they're upcycling it. How are they striking that balance currently? Yeah, so they're actually slightly different um, material streams. So. Typical products that would be upcycled would be produce trimmings, um, protein trimmings, um, or temperature sensitive um, products like deli meat or frozen products that have to be dealt with in quite a um, controlled manner and in a tight time frame. So those um, surplus streams wouldn't be going to food rescue organisations anyway. In the case of bread, for example, that's something that could go to food rescue organisations. But here in New Zealand, um, there's actually a huge amount of bread available to these food rescue organisations. And some of them are pushing back saying we have too much. Um, this is not delivering, you know, a, a nutritional and balanced diet that our clients need. And so they, you know, there's too much on the market anyway. So um, I think there would always be that hierarchy approach that if it can go to food rescue, it should go first. And if it can't, um, and it can go to upcycling, it should go there. But um, they are they are quite distinct um, surplus streams. So within the supermarkets that you work in, do you have a feel for what percentage of the surplus food would end up going potentially to uh, upcycled products versus say being donated or if they can't meet either of those then being composted or another treatment option? Yeah so um, well, I did a quick calculation before um, before this webinar and I think that the potential for foodstuffs um, to in terms of food that could go to upcycling is about 11,000 tonnes a year uh, so that's product that's um, trimmings and, and byproducts from our kind of fresh food um, areas. But when we look at food waste and how, how that's kind of split up, um, from my masters, I, when I did the quantification of that, we found that about 23% goes to landfill, uh, about 15% goes to food rescue organisations, about 46% goes to, um, to farmers or um, people producing animal feed. Uh, and then I think about 15% is protein that goes to rendering. Um, the stuff that goes to farmers for animal feed and the stuff that goes to um, protein rendering, all of that um, has the potential to be upcycled and go back into the human food chain because it's produced to that level um, for human consumption. So I think, um, you know, that's about, what is it, 61% of that food waste definitely could go somewhere else. Um, 
and most of the stuff going to landfill, if it was caught earlier, it probably could be given a second life. And, and it's about when you, it's about having good plans and processes in place for identifying the best place for the food waste to go so that you can get the most value out of it rather than waiting a bit too long and then not having another option. We only have about 1% of our um, food waste going to compost here in New Zealand. And I think that's very different to other countries. It's um it's just not we we haven't really got the infrastructure. Yeah, we have the infrastructure set up in well South Australia where I'm based. Um, there's a lot of compost infrastructure, and there's a lot of benefits from from doing that too. And you know it's important to say that not all food waste can be upcycled, um, and you know not all of it can be donated. So those composting technologies and anaerobic digestion and heat treatment into animal feed they're an important part of the solution too but obviously the, the focus of today's chat is how do we get the highest value out of the food and prevent it from from being pushed down the hierarchy so you know that that um upcycling food is a really important part of that picture so to other supermarkets listening on this webinar today what what would you say to them if they're looking to embark on a journey to reducing food waste in their supermarket, but also up and down, but up the supply chain and down to consumers. What would your advice be to them on where to start and, and what the biggest wins might be for them? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in terms of being involved as an ingredient supplier to companies wanting to make upcycled foods, segregating your waste streams is the most important thing to do because if you can have separate, um, separate food groups, and separate materials that increases what value you can get out of it. Uh, so I would definitely encourage organisations, retailers or wholesale organisations to really get it down to the most granular level. So, um, you know, leafy greens together or, you know, if, as, as small as you can break it down, the more value you can extract from it. Um, so that we've seen a lot of um, success and a lot of opportunities arise from segregating our waste streams. Um, in terms of stocking products, I think um, I would encourage organisations actually to engage with the Upcycled Food Association so um, they can actually talk to uh, companies who are producing these foods and get a sense of, um, you know, a lot of companies would have done their own market research as well about what kind of potential there is um, and getting some samples so that they can be tried. And um, I think the evidence that we gathered from our consumer insights is that consumers want this, they want sustainable options, they, they are able to draw that link between food upcycling and sustainability um, and good purchasing decisions. And I think, you know, the, there is, there's a body of research out there that kind of all indicating that positive positive uptake and positive response. So I think it's definitely worth uh, investing some time and resources into, into investigating for their own local context. Absolutely. So segregating ways you talk about, so to start that process is it's as simple as getting good back of house bin systems just to sort them with the food into the different um, streams that you talked about? Yeah, I mean, it's easier said than done. Um, I think, you know, we, we've been working on our waste minimization program since 2014 and segregating is really hard that, you know, you get a lot of cross contamination when you have new staff and if you haven't got good training processes in place, you know, it's, it, it is really hard. But I think having good signage is very important. Uh, when you have separate bins set up and signage with pictures, you know, it's much easier to get, um, you know, get that information in one go if it's if it's pictorial based. If things are colour coded, it makes it a lot easier as well. Um, and especially when it's sensible colour coding, you know, red means meat and green means produce. Um, one of the things I'm working on at, at the moment is actually putting together some videos so that when new staff members join, you can show them a video um, about how we deal with waste. And I think it's about setting a really good culture and a really good precedent um, that this is how things are done and these are, this is why we're doing it and really getting that buy-in from staff. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the, um, 
the deli meat to um, pet food story, we've seen amazing buy-in from staff who really want to put aside all of the all of the surplus meat that they can to go into this supply chain because they are part of it and they know what it's going towards and then they can turn around and see it on their on the shelf in the store that they work at and say hey I was part of that so I think um, yeah giving people really good ownership over the process and um, and explaining the why is very important yeah I, I would agree with that because you know sometimes when you just tell people to sort materials into a bin if they don't understand why they're not going to be motivated to do it um, but yeah, if you could, if you tell them why, they're probably more likely to, to bother. Have you ever thought about things like incentive schemes um, for staff or departments um, who are doing the right thing from managing um, the discarded materials in the supermarkets? Yeah, I mean, I think the way that we've approached it so far is that we, we measure all of our um, waste streams and we kind of have a leaderboard and that had um, previously it had been focused on diversion. So the stores that had the highest diversion percentage, um, they that was actually built into KPIs and things. So, you know, some stores were diverting up to 96% of their waste away from landfill, which is amazing. Uh, and I think it's that um, it's, sometimes it's those kind of incentives um, that create that competition between different, different teams and different business units. I think we could do more in the way of incentivizing good behavior. I think, um, you know, often it, a lot of businesses just expect their staff to do the right thing and they're not prepared to actually um, disincentivize the wrong things. So it's always good, but I think, you know, we could, we could go further in considering how to, how to reward that really good behavior um, because it's not, it is, it's, it's not, as easy as just chucking everything in the same bin. And you have to acknowledge that it, you know, it, it does take effort, um, but it is worth the, the outcomes in the end. Mm. So you've talked about the role of the supermarket in educating its staff and doing the right thing with its own streams. Um, you've talked about up the supply chain, working with suppliers of upcycled food to, to make sure that their products are stocked on the shelves. Um, and you've talked about the consumer attitudes and providing that information to the consumers about the upcycled food so that they can identify it in the store. So it's really refreshing um, to see, to listen to you talk, Francesca, um, you know, working for a supermarket that's not just thinking about waste within their own four walls, but also considering the, up, the upstream and the downstream impacts. It's, that's really fabulous. So we've, um, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, some of them might be a bit challenging to answer, but I'll, I'll give, it, give it a go anyway, Francesca. So one of the really important things that I see from you know, working in Australia is to be able to put the business case together to you know, get grant funding or investment or otherwise to really accelerate some of these initiatives um, and to be able to demonstrate the value and why it's worth doing. And one of the questions that we had is, is do you know how much to gross state products, so how much value to New Zealand's gross domestic products, sorry, does upcycled food contribute? So how much does it um, offer to New Zealand's economy? Um, and if, if you don't know, can you give a guess or estimate? So a big question there, Francesca, I'm not sure if <laughs> any studies have been on that or maybe they should be done on that? Yeah, that is um, that is a big um, question. I think we haven't got any data on it in New Zealand at the moment. And I would say, you know, current state, we've only got a handful of businesses who are, you know, purposefully upcycling and wanting to market their product based on the fact that it's an upcycled product. Uh, there's just a handful. It's really, really new industry. So, um, I think it would be a really sensible thing to measure that um, that sort of ratio um, compared to GDP as we go forward and as the category expands. Uh, but mm. I guess I'll just refer back to that Future Market Insights study from the US that was done in 2019 that indicated that the, the global potential opportunity was $46 billion worth of, um, of um, I guess, um, 
income generated or revenue generated through um, upcycled foods um, and indications that that would be a 5% year on year growth rate. So I think it is, it is sub, a substantial um, pot <laughs> and substantial prize. And also when you think about organizations may be able to source those ingredients at a lower rate and a lot um, more affordably than a, a virgin resource. So um, I think it's actually really important that governments um, put the right incentives around encouraging products to be used for their best and highest use. Um, you know, we see it in, in the plastics world. We see it where, um, you know, governments are starting to, to specify that a minimum level of recycled content be used in those in new plastic products used to disincentivize those um, virgin resources from being used. So I think, you know, we I hopefully we're heading towards a, a world where we can see that for food as well. Yeah, maybe there's some policy measures as well um, that could be introduced by governments to incentivize it, whether I, I don't know whether it's some sort of <laughs> carrot or stick, excuse the pun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to to encourage more upcycling of food waste, so some sort of know, rebate or tax system that that rewards upcycling food rather than um, wasting it there. So we've got many more questions, but I'm afraid um, we've run out of time to answer them all today. And a lot of questions did focus on that measuring stuff, and, and Francesca, you did um, talk to that other report that you mentioned before, but I think that. It, these questions also highlight the need that perhaps more work needs to be doing in, in studying the potential for upcycling in individual countries. We've had questions about how much it was the potential in India. We've talked about some the questions about countries in Africa, um, also from Spain, we've got questions. So I feel like there's a there's a lot more work that needs to be done to, to help understand this issue more. But um, thank you for your perspectives today. You've done a brilliant job of, of covering the issue and talking about the opportunity. Um, just one last question before um, we wrap up this webinar today is, is what key takeaway would you like to leave with the audience? What are the one or two key takeaways? Um, I think that my, my key message would be that food waste reduction is one of the most tangible things that every single individual can be part of to reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, everybody um, has a relationship with food and it's one of those things that irrespective of the area that you work in, um, everybody, everybody has that opportunity to, um, to contribute towards um, food waste reduction and reducing the impacts of climate change. I think, you know, if you see these products available on your shelf, give them a go, give them a try. Um, and it's about really thinking creatively about the challenges that we face um, globally and creative solutions to mitigating some of those really big issues around um, social issues, environmental issues, and um, utilizing our food better is a huge opportunity there. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Francesca, for your time today and sharing all those insights. Um, so I understand that this webinar has been recorded and um, Sweeka will provide some more information about that. But as Sweeka mentioned at the beginning, um, this is just one of many webinars that I've been moderating together with Heise Langeveld on food waste. So um, you can jump across the Be Waste Wise website if you want to pick up any of the other discussions. But yeah, thank you very much to our audience as well. You've been <laughs> very interactive there with all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them today, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Francesca. That was a fantastic discussion. I'm sure the if you see the comments on the chat section, you'll pretty much realize that everyone's very happy with the uh, discussion that happened today. And uh, just, this is for the benefit of the audience. We will, I will liaise with uh, Kat and Francesca if there are any studies, any uh, reports that they would like to point us to. When this web when this webinar goes up on our website in two weeks, we'll ensure that these links are also there on our website for you to access. Um, in future. A reminder to the audience members, we have another panel uh, this Friday with uh, Cole Rossengren from US where he's going to talk about PFAS disposable, disposal in the uh, United States. So please ensure you register for that and also do sign up to our newsletter so that you have information about all future webinars because we will have Kat who will talk more about food waste uh, hopefully with us in future as well. 
thanks a lot, Kat and Francesca. Both of you have a good evening, and to the audience, have a good day and good evening. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>